from uh, Robert Lepkowitz. He comes from the USA, from New York. He worked many years in IT, information technology, and he has worked in telecommunications and Wall Street, to mention a few of the places he has worked in. At present, he is the chief technical officer and co-founder in Sharewave, and he's also writing a book that explores universal programming and literacy and open source, which is a present interest in his talk and the main reason why he's here, to share with us some of his knowledge and ideas about open source and universal programming literacy. Talking about this in particular helps him figure out a way to continue with his book so if anyone is sorry, so if anyone has ideas or suggestions, you can contact him eventually. So let's welcome now Robert Rommel Lekowitz with a warm row of applause. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here, and I apologize that I cannot. Uh, speak it in Spanish, but, but I was invited uh, to speak. I did not have time to learn Spanish um, in time for this. This is a, a continuation or a, 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 a reprise of a talk that I gave at PyCon 2007 and in the US, and, and I've heard that um, some of you have heard this before, so um, indulge me. Um, I, I'm from New York. New Yorkers uh, have a reputation for being fast talkers, so I'm, I'm trying to slow down. And, but if I get excited, which I may very well get excited, then I'll start speeding up, and I'll be going much faster than I would. Then, if somebody would uh, remind me that I should slow down, I would appreciate it. I am not a Python. Uh, I'm not a Pythonista. Um, so I assume that the reason that I was invited here, my contribution to the Python community, is that when my son learned to program in school, he learned to program in Java because they taught Java. And I convinced him to, uh, to learn Python instead. And then he went on to write uh, Twisted. <laughs> and, and so Twisted is my first grandchild. Um, but other than that, I have uh, my, my, my interest, uh, in, my involvement in Python is, is, is certainly nowhere near as much as my son's. I'm interested in um, rhetoric. That's why I'm speaking. Um, and my thesis is that um, rhetoric and programming are the same thing, or, or to put it another way, the, that the 21st century extension of the classical art of rhetoric we call programming. And that's what I want to talk about. The reason to talk about it is that if programming is literacy, and literacy is programming, then if we, we, we have 2,000 years of history maybe more, with, with literacy and literacy education. And so there might be something that we could learn for what we did right or what we did wrong. Um, but of course, they may be different than literacy, and we should understand those differences if we can as well. This is not a new idea. This is not um, my idea. It was a very popular idea in the 80s. Now, one of the things because I only have an hour and a half for this talk, or two, um, and it would be not, not enough time to talk about everything that I would want to talk about. Um, so I'm in the habit of providing book references for people who are interested in particular topics. Um, so I have many of my slides are book references. Uh, you don't have to copy them all down. Uh, if you email me, I will cheerfully send you the slides. Uh, and, and a bibliography. Um, it's curious, you will notice, that most of the books that I'm quoting here were 
written between 1984 and 1986 for some reason. Uh, Donald Knuth uh, gave a name to this thing that I'm talking about, which was literate programming. And the way he phrased it was that programming, a programmer could be regarded as an essayist whose main concern is with exposition and excellence of style. And he invented a system which he called web. And the, and he, the reason he called it web actually was pretty funny, was he wrote, it was the only three-letter word in the English language that I could find that wasn't used for something in computers. So web was a system where if you wrote a program, it would either run through a compiler or it could be published as a paper on computer science. So the idea that the text was both a program and an essay. That was the web system. And Knuth wasn't the only one. In uh, 1985, Abelson and uh, Sussman published their textbook on computer science. Um, and he, in the introduction, he starts with, first we want to establish the idea that a computer language is not just a way of getting a computer to perform operations, but rather that it is a novel medium for expressing ideas about methodology. Thus, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So here we have both the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States professors saying, nah, programs are the way people talk to each other about algorithms, and the computers got nothing to do with it. And it was right around this time, in 1984, that Richard Stallman writes the GNU Manifesto. What does he say about that? Well, you need access to the source because it's a, it's a requisite for people to be able to read this software. It's all part of that same feeling that in the 80s we had this idea that software was about people and not about machines. <clears throat> in fact, this is a slide from a presentation Guido Van Rossum gave in 1999 uh, in which he was talking about his CP4E initiative, Computer Programming for Everyone, in which he was going to teach everybody how to program. The CP4E project is dormant, according to Wikipedia. Um, so, what happened? In the 1980s, every book that you pick up about computer science talks about how it's all about people, it's not about machines. And today, it's much more about machines. And a little bit about people. So I want to understand, I want to bring it back actually, to the CP4E idea that everybody can program, because we teach everybody how to read. And if it's about reading, then we should understand the history of literacy. So I'm going to take a small 40-minute diversion to talk about the history of literacy. But because this is a programming crowd, um, I will then bring it back to programming and to talk about programming languages of the future. Uh, assuming that we have a sort of a literate view of programming, once again. My favorite book on rhetoric was written by Sister Miriam Joseph, and the first edition was published in 1938. And Sister... <coughs> this book is about the trivium. So the, 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 the curriculum in the Middle Ages, they taught three things to everybody. Uh, they taught the logic, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Rhetoric being the most advanced of the three. Uh, since it was three things, it was called the trivium, and this is where we get our English word trivial, which means something anybody knows, because in the beginning it was the university course of these three things, but eventually they taught it to everybody, and the thing that everybody knew was trivial. <clears throat> Here's the definition. Logic is concerned with the thing as it is known. Grammar with the thing
thing as it is symbolized, and rhetoric is concerned with the thing as it is communicated. And this was the sentence that made me think, she's talking about programming. If rhetoric is the art of communicating through symbols, ideas about reality, how is that different than programming? Programming is in fact communicating ideas about reality to machines and other people. So rhetoric is the master art. It is programming. <clears throat> when we talk to machines, we are using the rhetoric of the machine. So this idea of language and literacy that I uh, not only infuses the, uh, the programmers of the 80s, but the philosophers of the 60s and the 40s. A uh, famous collection of essays, which was called The Linguistic Turn, came out in 1967, which had a group of essays from philosophers through the 30s and 40s. <clears throat> and my favorite out of those is Bertrand Russell, is quoted as saying, by means of the study of syntax, we can come to a considerable knowledge concerning the structure of the world, which I think a programmer would appreciate. <clears throat> so, if rhetoric or programming is communicating ideas about the reality to people and machines, then we have a bit of a duality. So the literacy part is communicating ideas to people, and the engineering part is communicating ideas to machines, and that, that may be different. That may be why we oscillate back and forth between, between thinking of programming as something we do between people and thinking of programming as sort of a mechanical art that we use to make machines do the things that we want them to do. It's because when you write a program, you're talking to two classes of beings. So in 1986, in a study of literacy, Havelock discovers a general pattern of literacy, which he writes about, which he says that shortly after the introduction of writing in any society, a craft literacy develops, in which writing is a trade practiced by craftsmen whom you would hire, much as, much as you might hire a stonemason to build a house a shipwright to build a ship, or a programmer to write a program. So the fact that programmers are a small group of people that we hire to write programs for us would be entirely consistent with the idea that it's a new kind of writing, and that's how it always starts out. That we, we do that not because we're talking to machines, but we do that because it's a new kind of writing. I'm going to apologize that what I'm talking about here is not going to be necessarily immediately useful to anybody, but that's because, because I have a 1,000 year time frame in mind. <laughs> and the reason I arrive at the 1,000 year time frame is because, because in 789 AD, Charlemagne, who was famously illiterate, wrote an epistle, a, a capitulari, a, a, an edict, in which he said, we should teach everybody how to read. Well, he actually said every boy how to read, but, but you know, uh, adjusting for the times in which it was said, we can, the, the spirit was. And, and, and he specifically called out, I'm not just talking about people of noble birth, I'm talking of people in servile condition as well. Everybody needs to learn how to read. But, and, that didn't happen immediately. I mean, he said, no, we should teach everybody how to read, and it takes a thousand years before everybody, sort of, we get come close to the idea that everybody's starting to read. So, so I'm putting it in this, and we have not yet arrived at the 789 equivalent, right? Nobody, no emperor or president or, has stood up and said, we're gonna teach everybody how to read in my country. Read programs. <clears throat> so, why is that? Well. Should I talk about that here? Um, yeah, let me give his reason. So the reason Charlemagne gives why we need to teach everybody how to read is because if you're going to be good, if you're going to 
obey the Word of God, you must know the Word of God. And although somebody could tell you it's all written down, and if the priests can read it so that they know how to be good, then why not should everybody read so that they know how to be good? Wouldn't that make everybody better? So the reason for teaching everybody how to read is reading will make you a better person. You will be more good if you know how to read. That's the reason that we have universal literacy today. So in a history of reading, which I'm sorry was written in this millennium, uh, what percentage of the people are reading 300 years or so after Charlemagne says everybody should know how to read? And we're thinking 5%. And if we think to ourselves, how many people program, how many people are literate in programming today? 5%. Less, less than 5%. <clears throat> so, and one of the things I love about this is, is the half that of ancient Rome. So, so it means that you know, there was a peak in ancient Rome and then it declined. But of course, we, we don't live in a period of decline. right? We live in a period of growth. And it's not like the Middle Ages, uh, unless you look at Brady Booch's chart about the percent of IT professionals who actually write code, and he takes a chart going from 1945 up till 2005, and uh, steadily declining through the years is the number of people in IT who actually write code. They do other things, project management, and writing specifications, things like that. They don't need to know how to code. So in fact, one could argue that we're following sort of the same arc that we followed with literacy. First, there was a sort of a burst of programming, and everybody was programming, and it was basic on every machine when you bought it and took it home, and then, and then it sort of declined. And when should we teach people how to program? My, my, my favorite advice on this score comes from Quintilian, who, 80 years after the birth of Christ, is recapping the argument, right, that there's really two schools of thought in Spain at the time, which is some people think you should wait until people are seven years old before you teach how to read, but he, he agrees with Chrysippus, right, who lived in 250 BC, right, three, two, three hundred years before, where he thinks that three, when they're three years old, you need to start teaching them how to read. So this is sort of the the argument that they're having today. So when we think about it today, I say, well, if we're going to make universal literacy for programming, would we, would we teach children starting at seven, or would we teach them starting at three? How many for seven? How many for three? Wow, we, we have more threes than sevens. How, how many think they're both too young? A few. All right. Know the answer to this. I, I think it might be a little too complicated <clears throat> because maybe, maybe programming literacy is different than rhetoric. I'm going to make this just brief thing. Is that in 1338 I came across I came across a census, right? This gentleman Giovanni Villani, who said that there are about 10,000 people in Florence who are learning to read. And then I got a census of Florence, about 80,000 people in Florence at the time, 1.83 children per family, roughly 40,000 children, so 10% of 1,000 children are learning to read, that's 25% of the population in Florence, children are, are, are being taught to be literate in the year 1338, before the invention of the printing press. But, only about 600 are being taught grammar and logic, because those are advanced. Programming, of course, we need the grammar and the logic. So maybe the reason we don't have so many programmers is not because it's like literacy, but because it's like rhetoric and you need grammar and logic and that's a skill that you only teach, why, if you work it out, uh, six, that would be, that would be 6%, no, 3%. We're not teaching everybody how to logic in Florence. Of course, we are more advanced than they were in Florence in 1338. But our literacy rate is about the same. And why? Because we did what everybody did in the Middle Ages. So 
So Pope Gregory famously said that for the ignorant people who can't read, pictures are the equivalent of reading. And, 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 and I mentioned 600 to 1025 because in 600 AD, Pope Gregory says this, and, and in 1025 AD, the Synod of Arras makes the same statement. Uh, they say, well, you know, you don't have to tell everybody to read because they can look at pictures and they'll be close enough. And that's why we have graphical user interfaces. <laughs> because for people who don't know how to program, it's good enough. And, and the last thing that I find, well, it's not the last thing, actually, I have tons of this stuff, but the last thing I think that I can talk about today uh, as to sort of the similarities between the state of literacy during the Middle Ages and the state of programming today, frightening thought, is that you could be literate in some field, but then if you switched to a different field, your literacy failed because the vocabulary was different, the syntax was different, and the language might be different. Right? If you're, and, and this is a little too early for that, but you know, 300 years after this, 500 years after this, if you wanted to write an opera, you had to write it in Italian. If you wanted to negotiate a treaty, you had to do it in French. If you wanted to study philosophy, you had to do it in Latin. Every discipline had its own special language. That was the language you usually wanted to do that kind of a thing. So to be an educated person, you had to know all of these languages. The appropriate one for the appropriate thing. So now I will introduce programming. <laughs> I got this off the uh, Mozilla site, uh, where they mention that, um, of course, according to the standard, you, you don't have to write code in the web in JavaScript. You write in any language you want. You specify the content type for your script, and the examples include, my personal favorite, text slash tickle. They don't have text slash Python. Why not? The famous treatise written in 1783 by a Frenchman who proclaimed that l'universalité de la langue française, which he says, si ce n'est si ce n'est si c'est clair, c'est français. Si ce n'est pas clair, c'est l'anglais ou grec ou latin ou l'italien. Right? If it is clear, then it must be French. If it is not clear, then it must be Italian or Greek or Latin or English. <laughs> because he had this theory that, that, that French syntax was the natural mapping of human thought into language. <laughs> and, and we know that to be true of JavaScript and web programming. <laughs> or not. So why, why don't we have text Python as a, as a choice? Well, Tickle never took off, is it? So, so, what, so the suggestion is it never took off. Um, I don't know that it was ever actually implemented. So I think the important thing about languages in this context, the same thing as with Italian for opera and, and so forth, is you use the language for the problem that you're solving because that's the language everybody uses for that problem. If you're going to program in a browser, there's JavaScript, and so JavaScript it is. Now, theoretically, you can say, well, oh, it's an open source browser, it's an open source language, right? Check out the code, fix the browser so that you can say Python, and go! It's a lot of work. <laughs> Nobody's going to have that browser, you have to get them to download it, etc. Uh, uh, Alright, Python may be a better language for some things, but for web development, it's better. It's, I mean, JavaScript is better. So, I work at a small company. Do we use Python? No. Well, yes. Where do we use Python? Well, because if you go to the Postgres site, even though you can use Tickle, <laughs> because apparently everybody uses Tickle, um, you could also use Python to write your stored procedures. So if you're writing a database application and you need triggers and stored procedures and business logic, you could do it in Python. It's there in 
the standard distribution, anybody who has Postgres installed has Python installed. So that's the only reason I use Python for that. Because there it is. And I would suggest that if we wanted more people to use Python, one could labor to say, if you were writing a database application, obviously, all of your stored procedures would be written in Python. And one of the things we do is, since we're writing stored procedures in Python, we do a lot of the business logic directly in Python. I'll give you an example of the kinds of crazy things that we do. If you have, as we do, a uh, user table where you keep the user profiles from the users who are registered on the site, if you insert a new user, and your user ID, of course, is your email ID. If you insert a new row into this table, the store, there's a trigger which sends an email, a verification email, to that email address. You know, we don't need a middle tier, we don't need cron jobs. Right? If you insert a row into the table, an email gets sent. If you reset the password field by blanking it out, a reset password email. So, any way that you touch the database, the right thing happens. And we do it in Python because there it is. It's the natural language for doing this kind of stuff. The other book that I want to mention from 1986, because all books, all good books about computers were written in 1986, is Understanding Computers and Cognition by Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores. Uh, this book was, was voted one of the ten most influential books in computer science of all time. It's a marvelous book. It's about the kinds of things that I'm talking about here, except it also goes into biology and philosophy and, and all kinds of interesting stuff. Because his main thesis is what he calls the language action perspective. His theory is that all information is communication. The other conclusion that he comes to is it's impossible to teach a computer how to understand natural language. And as a result of this, natural language, and he was the greatest, at the time, natural language researcher, so by writing this book he killed natural language research for 10 years. <clears throat> the point that he tries to make is, if he writes a computer program that responds to things that you type, the computer program is just the medium. It's really you, the person who wrote the program, and the person who's using the program, exchanging information through a web of commitments. So the computer is irrelevant, which is a theme that keeps coming up over and over again in the 1986. And so purely by coincidence, also in 1986, a different book was published about the history of the idea of a liberal education. And I, and I, and I love this book because liberal education is like free software. There's this word, free, liberal. Free software movement, I'd say free and libre software because it's that, you know, it's the liberal kind of free, not the, not the other kind of free. <clears throat> and the point that he makes is for the last 2,500 years, there's been a war raging between two camps as to what the right way to think about knowledge is. And the one camp, which he called the philosophers, is that the pursuit of knowledge is the thing. You have to know what the truth is. Diogenes, searching. Right, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. You search for the truth, you find the truth that makes you great because you have discovered the truth. That's the philosophy line. The orator line is less, it's not that they're not concerned with the truth, they'd like to know the truth too, but just knowing the truth is not sufficient because if you know the truth but you can't communicate it to other people and get them to act upon it, then it's not useful. So the greatest good is that you can communicate it, that you can create a community around this knowledge, and that when you've done that, you've changed the world. Because just knowing it isn't going to change the world. You have to make people embrace it and use it. And this is the battle between philosophers and orators that throughout history, first one side gains the ascendance, then the other side gains the ascendance. Sometimes of orators we say, oh, that's just rhetoric. Like it's <coughs> It's not the important thing. The important thing is truth. Sometimes we say, Pah, that's just truth. No, actually we never say that. But, um, but sometimes the pursuit of truth 
seems to take precedence our education system over the pursuit of building communities and vice versa. And I would argue that the open source community is really just a shift because the liberal education in the last 300 years had been trending up towards the philosopher side. And the whole open source movement, forgetting about the computer part, is just switching back down to the oratorical side of the balance between whether it's more important to have a better program or a better community. If you were a better community, you would be in this line, Isocrates and Cicero and Isidore. And the poet knows this. <clears throat> because in 1999, Saint Isidore was nominated to be the patron saint of programmers and the internet. I can't make this stuff up. <clears throat> anyway, so that explains history, more or less. That the forces that we see moving around in the open source community and the programming community in general are just the expected way of the development of literacy. But, but I think something else is going on that's affecting both, that's different than anything that has gone before in either. And that is the shift from reading to writing. So of course in the 1980s when people were worried about these things, um, Walter Alm writes this book where he's talking about the development of printing and other things, reading, writing, literacy, and so forth. And the point that he makes is, a weird thing happens when printing is developed. And the weird thing that he calls this, he calls, before printing, literacy was called manuscript culture. He calls it, and after it is print culture. And before printing, to make a book, or to, you had to write it on a manuscript, to read a book, you had to acquire the manuscript to read it. And that the whole idea of manuscript had a different ethos. People had a different culture concerning the importance of writing and the things that went along with writing, and among other things, since it was so hard to write a book, you would create texts out of other texts. We call that forking today. You would fork a text, you see, and then you would borrow and adapt and share the original text. And you actually didn't care so much about who wrote which piece, right? Because it was sort of this common thing, because getting a manuscript, producing a manuscript, sharing a manuscript was difficult in and of itself. And then, printing is invented. And about 50 years after printing is invented, we invent the idea of creativity and authorship. And now we care who thought of the idea. Before that, we didn't care. Before that, you know, maybe it came from God, maybe it came from somebody you don't know. But it didn't matter. Because in the end, everything came from God. So, so who cares? But then, when you could write a book and print it, the whole world could see it. The other thing that happened was, it wasn't a manuscript where people kept scribbling it on it and changing it. It was a book. Everybody had the same book. It was finished. I wish my book were finished. But, you know, at some point, when it's finished, then you'd say, oh, I wrote it. That's my work. You can't, you can't see it. And curiously enough, when you get to the open source world, we're shifting back to a manuscript kind of culture. Not, not that we have uninvented printing, but now that we have sort of a new form of thing, and it's sort of difficult early in the beginning, and we don't know how it works exactly, we have sort of this manuscript culture that's, that's evolved around the whole thing. It's, uh, in, in, in critical circles, it's called intertextuality. I mean, you don't care who wrote it, and you share the texts, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> And so, so the, la the last book on literacy, I think this is the last one, quote, um, which, which, which shaped my personal odyssey to date and has changed my thinking through the years about, about what's going on here, was this collection of essays by Deborah Brandt, which was published in this millennium. It's not from the 1980s. So this is new thinking. We <coughs> and this is my theory. This is not Deborah Brandt's theory, but she said something that made me think of this. And so there are four ages of literacy for um, programmers because the first age is the zeroth age. If you're not a programmer, there's three ages of literacy. Or if you went to Catholic school, there's three ages of literacy. So before Socrates, there is no literacy. People read, people are right. Alright, so there's no doesn't matter. Then a few people write and a few people read. 
And that's the manuscript age. Then, Gutenberg happens, and there's lots of writers. I'm sorry, lots of readers, but still not that many writers. To be an author is still difficult. <clears throat> and lastly, what happens is, and I don't know who to give credit for here, it hasn't been long enough, maybe in 500 years we'll look back and we'll pick a winner, but between the inventions of texting and SMS and Twitter and desktop publishing and like all the stuff that happened in the 80s, <laughs> um, we shift to pretty much everybody's writing. In fact, in Deborah Brandt's book, she talks about sort of the decline in literacy in certain places and how literacy, in, and, and everybody bemoans this as a study of the American National Education Association where they're talking about the, you know, the bemoaning the, the, the drop in literacy at the same time pointing out that writing is increasing phenomenally. And they don't, but, of course, it's of a little quality. Which, which is what you would expect when it democratizes. That's what people said actually when, when the printing press was invented was that People were printing trash. <clears throat> I, I gave it to Jobes just because he's the dead one. <laughs> I mean, this is, those are the people who invented those other things that I, that I mentioned. So, so, but you know, that, that's been changed. And so the, <clears throat> so, 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 so this was the end of my odyssey. I was talking to somebody at dinner last night and they said, oh, you love Project Euler. So I know at least one person in the room knows what I'm talking about here. Project Euler is a website that has math problems. And the idea is you sort of work on programming these math problems in the programming language of your choice. <clears throat> and one of the questions that they ask in the frequently asked question is, I learned so much from solving, you know, problem 53 on, on Euler.net. Do you mind if I publish my, my findings? Because on the side it says, at, you know, when you solve the problem, if you want to talk about it, do it in our forums. Don't publish it somewhere else. So the question is, well, can I post my, my solution on GitHub or, you know, on my blog? Because I'm so proud of it. And the answer that they give on the site is, and I will paraphrase instead of quote, there is nothing like that moment when you go, ah, I got it. And you, having felt that moment, want to share it. But if you share it, you will steal it from everybody else. Don't steal that moment that you love so much. And that changed my mind about open source. Because it's what Charlemagne said. Charlemagne said, the reason we teach people to read is because it makes them better people. And that's why we need to teach everybody how to read and write. But mostly read, because they don't need to write, because when he said it, we were in that first age where there weren't a lot of readers and there weren't a lot of writers, and we were moving to the age where there were a lot of readers, but still not a lot of readers. So the important thing was, if people read, they will become better people, and we should teach them how to read. But what Project Euler did was that with software, it's not reading software that makes you a better person. It's writing software that makes you a better person. If you write software, if you struggle to write it and you succeed, you have made something. You have made something other people can use. You have figured something out. You have learned something by the act of doing it. And that makes you a better person. But if you read somebody else's code, that doesn't impart any moral instruction. That doesn't make you a better person. It's different than reading, and that's the difference. That in order to become a better person in programming, you have to write. And that we are at the cusp of an age where non-programming literacy is making also the shift from lots of readers and a few writers to lots of writers. And that the fact that these two things are happening at the same time, I believe, is no coincidence. So that, in fact, what we need to do going forward is say, look, everybody needs to learn how to write. And they need to learn how to write talking to people and machines. 
And if they do it right, when they talk to the machines, other people will learn from it as well. So that's where we are. So I have a use case. I did not get very good feedback from the Free Software Foundation at Oscon when I said I have a use case where sharing the source code is bad. <laughs> now, granted, you may say, oh, that's a very special use case. It's like, yeah, but I, as a mathematician, you know, as a, as a failed mathematician, I was sort of pleased with the an existence proof. <laughs> All right. Thank you for indulging me in uh, my hobby of rhetoric and medieval literature and so forth. So now, Save some time to talk about programming. So what does all this mean for programming? Well, let us recap. What are the great advances in programming that have happened since the beginning of programming? And I googled this and I didn't find anything good. They said, you know, object orientation, which, which I, I disagree. So, I made my own list. Uh, of course, everybody agrees subroutines. The invention of subroutines was Probably the greatest programming advance of all time. Does, that, does anybody know what we used to do before? Is anybody here? Uh, I guess some of you may be old enough. I, I may be the only one old enough. Um, but some of you may have studied in school what we used to do before the invention of the subroutine. Hmm? Yeah, go to, but even better, I'm not thinking, IBM mainframe, we did Ballard. Do we remember Ballard? Let me explain Ballard, it's so cool. Ballard stood for branch and link return. So, you had to do a go-to, which is correct, that's the branch part. But if you do a go-to somewhere else, you never get back. I mean, you needed to get back, usually. That's, that's why we met some scenes. So, but what you could do in the battle or instruction set was, you could say, I'm, I want to branch there and save my current program counter in a register. And I will specify the register. So you had to worry about which register you're putting in. And by convention, everybody used register 14 for this. So, you, so then, when, whenever you were wherever you were, you could then say, oh, I'm going to branch back to whatever's in register 14. That'll take me back to where I came from. And then, if you needed the register for something else, you had to remember to save it so you know where to go back to and so on. Anyway, so Ballard was how we used to do it in the ancient times. And then we met these other teams. And, and, and that one's kind of obvious, and nobody argues with that and says we should go. But, you know, when we did garbage collection and automatic memory management, people argued with that. They said, that's not a good idea. It'll slow things down. Right? And try catch. Right? That, that got implemented in the 80s. Uh, and then, you know, people would argue, oh, that's a terrible way of doing things. You should check return codes, error codes, because, you know, you never know what happens when you do a try catch. It's too slow. Uh, I think package management is one of the huge... Things. Every, pretty much every language has a site where you can go and get a bunch of packages for that language. Right? Python has, you know, you can pip stuff, and Perl has CPAN, and, and so on. Um, and, and lastly, I'll say x dot because x dot killed the idea of literal programming. Knuth's thing, where he said, oh, you should write this thing, and then it'll automatically generate the documentation. He had a much more sophisticated idea of what constituted documentation, but we do that today with Java doc, and Py doc, and Perl doc, and all the doc docs. We can come back to this slide. Uh, this is what I think is sort of going on today in terms of, of things that are happening that some people use and think is a good idea and other people say no, not, but you know, it's sort of languages are changing to incorporate these things more or less. Um, I like some of them because, I, I think actually this one is the annotations is the most important long term because the annotation that I want to see is the annotation that says, I tried doing it this way and it didn't work and that's why I'm doing it this other way. But I want to see both versions in there in case the world changes and the version that used to work like works better now to sort of switch it back. But you can't do that in any programming language. And, but okay, anyway. Um, so we can come back to this with the interest of time so that I can get to the end of my presentation and we can talk about this stuff over the years. <clears throat> I talk about the things where pretty much every time that I suggest we should do this, uh, everybody comes up to me afterwards and says, that's a really stupid idea and it would never work. Um, and so I'm hoping that an audience that doesn't speak the same language that I do won't notice how stupid of an idea this is. <clears throat> 
And I'll start with the idea that most people, in whatever language they speak as their native language, have a vocabulary of 50,000 words, far less. Educated people may be more. But pretty much you can expect people to know 50,000 words. How many programming languages have 50,000 keywords? None. Not even close. Right? If you include all the li standard libraries, how many words do we have? Closer to 1,000 than 10,000 is where we are. Um, and I think this is what holds us back from viewing it as literacy. With a mere 1,000 words, you, you just can't get very expressive. Right? So I'm going to make fun of my grandchild here. Because I can. Without offending anybody but people in the family. So you know, if you look at the sort of the Twisted library, and you, you go to some of the modules in Twisted, uh, the one that I want to focus on here is Twisted Spread Banana. So, what's a banana in programming? I, do, I don't know. Right, what's a manhole? I, I, I don't know. It's a round thing that covers holes that let you go down into the sewer. So, and I'm, and I'm sure there's a reason for it, but when you, if you're using a vocabulary where people have no idea what you're talking about, whether it's English talk, you know, and Spanish, and there's a language barrier, it's a barrier. The things that work are the things where everybody's kind of agreed on the same word across all languages. And this takes time. Uh, but it sort of helps if it doesn't mean something else. Right, so map, we're sort of getting to everybody in whatever language you're doing it, map means the same thing. Read means the same thing. Uh, open and close. Sort of. But I think we need to get to 50,000. <clears> so in that book about understanding cognition, uh, Terry Winograd talks about uh, a thought experiment that was done by the German philosopher Wittgenstein, which was called Wittgenstein's box, matchbox. <clears throat> uh, or Wittgenstein's Cockroach. If I have a, if everybody in the world has a matchbox, he said, and nobody can look at what's inside anybody else's matchbox, but everybody has something in their matchbox, maybe. But whatever the thing is in your matchbox, you call that a cockroach. But you never know. So when you talk about it, you say, "Oh, that's my cockroach," and somebody else says, "Oh, here's my." Have my cockroach, but he doesn't, doesn't show it. Now, what he may have is a stone in there, or a piece of a pen, or some colored sand. How would you know what he means by cockroach? And so that's kind of the problem that we're facing with getting to 50,000 words, is each language has a little matchbox with a bunch of words that they use for their language, and it's difficult to arrive at a 50,000 word vocabulary. The other thing that's difficult about it is we're hamstrung by the baggage of our past. All right, so soft, I remember the first programming languages that I used, the effort was to make the interpreter be less than 300,000 bytes. Because more than that would be bloat. And then I remember when you yeah, wanted to keep your interpreter down to under three megabytes because more than that would be bloat. And so on and so forth. And the last version of Mathematica that I installed, which is a programming environment for doing all kinds of interesting things, it was nine gigabytes. And Mathematica may be coming very close to having a 50,000 word vocabulary. <clears throat> so it's great that we have things like CPAN and Python.org, we have all these libraries. But why isn't it all part of the standard library? Why isn't it all part of the distribution? Right? If you just downloaded Python, it was 3 gig, and you installed it, and you had everything. What would be the harm in that? Other than the cognitive load of all of these words that you have no idea what they mean, that are confusing you, and you don't know which ones to ignore. And I think it's the editorial function. Right? It's the invention of the dictionary, or the explanation, or the something which Mathematica tries to address. But my first version of Mathematica came on a CD. 
and there was a book that came with it, it was 300 pages. And my second version came on a CD, and there was a book that came with it, which was 600 pages. The next version came on a DVD, and it was a book that came with it, which was 1,200 pages. And the next version didn't have a book because it would have been too big, and it was all the documentation was online and so forth. So I, I love looking at Mathematica for what the future might look like in programming. So this is how you would write the program to compute the area of a circle. And I love this example because it's so simple. It's a simple formula that everybody knows. And when you see it written down, everybody can agree that's the way you would write it down in grammar school, where you would write this thing. And how many programming languages can you type this in? The answer is only Mathematica. <clears throat> now, lest you say, well, that's, you know, futuristic mumbo-jumbo, which would never work in real life, <clears throat> Edward Tufte, who wrote this book, does seminars, and he's a book collector. And one of the things that he has is a first edition Galileo, which he brings to class if you have an opportunity to take his seminar. I would highly recommend it. It's the most interesting seminar I've ever attended. Plus, he walks around with this 1560 edition of Galileo, and what he points out is, you see right there in the middle where there's that circle, and then the other sort of weird shape there? When Galileo was writing about whatever he was writing about, he just said, oh, and so, so it's kind of, kind of, I saw something that looked like this, and the this is right next. It's not a footnote, it's not an appendix, it's not C figure one on page 392, right? It's like this, right here. I just, and I'd say I type it in line, but they didn't type this kind of stuff back then. Uh, and so Tufty, when he wrote his book, this one here, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, which I cannot remember. He had to found his own publishing company to publish his book so that he could print the things that he wanted to print in the way he wanted to print them because nobody could typeset the things he wanted to typeset. And we're afraid of that. Like we're not even trying to solve that problem. So this was a slide from 2007. I said you can't even define a function called atualization. So Python 3, you can. So that slide is obsolete. We're making progress. And in fact, you can even, to take my previous example, you can assign pi to be something, and that works. Awesomeness. We're making progress. But we have all these symbols that we could use for all kinds of interesting things, which every school child knows what they mean. And when we do other domains of literacy, like teaching people how to read music, we don't say, oh, everything has to be ASCII text that might be colorized in the editor. Not colorizing is great. I love colorizing. We use symbols that make sense in the domain that we're working in. So if I wanted to do a set membership operator, how would I do that? Can't in Python. I can in Mathematica. I can in Haskell, which is open source. So this is from my session there. I define epsilon to be membership. So I can say is 3 a member of the set 136? And the answer is true or false. It actually works. So I'd argue that that vocabulary that you need for those people who say, well, yeah, but nobody's ever going to learn how to type epsilon and pi and all that kind of stuff because it's not on the keyboard. I'd say we have millions, hundreds of millions of people who have learned how to type stuff that's not on the keyboard in all kinds of interesting ways and they do it all the time. It's merely a matter of literacy education. You teach this stuff to children in school when they're in grammar school. ActChina.com. It's a great site. A lot of open source software using glyphs that you don't know what they mean. So my second proposal for something that <clears throat> would never work is I observe that if you have an application and you change your default language on your computer, and I use a Mac, but you can try this on your Ubuntu or 
Windows or whatever you use. If I say, oh, I'm a Portuguese speaker, not, not only does it change all the menu items to be in Portuguese, which is kind of what I expected, but then when I went to Google, I got Google in Portuguese. That wasn't even on my computer. How did they know? I was really impressed. I said, oh, does this work for French? Yes, it does work for French. So, pretty much, browsers, word processors, power, you know, keynote presentation software, pretty much everything lets me do this. Now, how do I write a program in Python in Portuguese, using the Portuguese keywords in Python? Or has one? And the answer is, I can't. Well, why not? How hard would it be? That if I wrote a program, if I were a Spanish speaker, say, I would write my programs in Spanish. And if an English speaker wanted to work, collaborate with me on my program, they would open it up in their IDE, and their IDE is smart enough to parse the whole thing and colorize it. It knows which words are the keywords. It knows where the variables are. It knows all this stuff. And whether you're using a graphical IDE or a text-based IDE, it figures all this stuff out. It can pop up help. It knows that get data deferred size is, you know, that thing, and it's got a help text associated with it. How hard would it be for it to just say it in Spanish? Nothing's stopping it from doing that. So, so why don't we do that? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, I'm surprised with a uh, uh, world macro language when you are in mm -hmm. the communication, when you are here in the Spanish, and you try to learn one and the other, and you Ah, so and what? It was, it was too, too simple the solution. You just put the, the keyboards in one language and the other, they never translated. They never had that. So they made I'm sorry? So, 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 so the, the, the audience suggests for the cameras that, that Microsoft tried this and they internationalized their, their uh, visual basic you know, board macro, Excel macro languages, and it didn't work. Um, from which we can conclude that it is not possible in theory or that they just did a bad job? Okay, so they did a bad job. So, so it could be done because we do do it for all of these other programs where we figure out how to kind of make that work sort of. And, but, <clears throat> now I floated this idea first at a, at a European conference, so, which, which was a, and, and, and I had people at the table, there were Belgians and Dutch and Germans and Spaniards, I, every language, Norwegians, and every single one of them said, no, 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 if you want to write a program, you have to do it in English. And all I could hear was, if you want to write a scientific treatise, you have to do it in Latin. True. I mean, for some period of time in history, it, it, it is true. And then somebody figured out, well, no, we could, we could write it in German or something else. And, and then people would translate it and it would work. So, <clears throat> I think that, you know, if you want to get to a 50,000 word vocabulary, you have to think about managing vocabulary in a more sophisticated way. And part of the management of the vocabulary might be managing the vocabulary across languages, which we know how to do in some cases. So if we're thinking about making it more sophisticated, let's make it more sophisticated enough to handle the problem of how do you do this across multiple languages. Because we know you can. It's, 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 might be harder than getting Python to run as a script language in a browser, but it's, it's on the order of, yeah, I mean, you can do that. We, we can figure out how. So I promised Emiliano that I would speak for no more than one hour. And it's been 58 minutes since I started. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> um, but I'm going to hang around I'm, until I leave. I'll, I'll be here all day tomorrow. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be up all night tonight. I do not plan on sleeping until I leave and go back home. Um, so, so anybody who would like to, you know, I would, I would love to talk to anybody about it further at, at, at greater length than I'm sure you want to hear about it. Um, 
at your convenience. So I'll, I'll show up tomorrow and, and we can do that. Uh, in the meantime, I didn't, I, I don't know if we want to take questions now or go become informal, but why don't I open it up for questions? Anybody has questions in this forum? Ah, we do have a question. So the question is, other than Haskell and Python, do I see a language going in the direction uh, that, I'm thinking, uh, that I'm seeing? So, what I'd start with is Mathematica is probably the one that's closest in, in some regards, right? They have the most sophisticated layout engine, right? So, I talked about, you know, we, you can, we can define pi in, uh, in, in Haskell and in Python, but, but when we say pi r squared, if we want to show how do you square something, we don't have a way of sort of writing the two a little smaller than the r and pushing it up a little bit, <laughs> um, which which would be important, right? So we, we use a hat or something, right? So 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 Mathematica has this whole notion of layout matter, sort of the Galileo problem of if I just wanted to show a little thing like that, how would I get that in there? Um, it's Mathematica. That, Haskell has. So, and Haskell is an interesting language. That one of the reasons I got interested in it was because, because I read that Guido Van Rossum had, had borrowed list comprehensions from Haskell. And I thought, aha, so any, anything that Python is looking to for new ideas might be an interesting place to look for new ideas. So I think Haskell has got a lot of interesting new ideas um, that are worth sort of looking at to, for incorporation. Um, you know, Visual Basic has done interesting things as well that, uh, that, that, that one can use. Um, but, you know, in the Middle Ages, an educated person would learn six or eight languages. And, uh, and so I feel inadequate uh, that next to, you know, the Middle Ages, uh, it's so hard for me to learn six or eight languages well enough to be fluent in them. Um, but I will, so there's a couple of interesting, I hesitate to suggest this one because it was my, it was my mother tongue in programming. Um, and one of the most brilliant languages of all time and nobody will admit to having learned it ever and it doesn't exist anymore and you can't learn it ever again. But it was APL. Um, so APL, in fact, this, in, when I first used it in 1971, um, so APL has no keywords because everything is a, is a mathematical or symbol or Greek letter or some Unicode character. This was before Unicode. So the, actually, the author of APL, the guy who invented it, he and his wife sat around the kitchen table and they, and they carved um, type balls for you know, letter forms for type balls for selected typewriters, so that they could they could write in this notation that he had invented, uh, because there was there was actually no typewriter in the world that would make these funny characters. Um, but all the error messages were internationalized, so you could set your you, you didn't anything that you wrote was understandable across languages because it didn't matter. But if you got an error message and you were sent to Polish, you would see a Polish error message. So I thought, well, that, that's a place to start. See, that's what you could do. You could say, open a file in Python, and you might say open in English, but the error message could be in Spanish. Right? So APL started. So APL had a lot of interesting ideas, um, and, and it's a source of inspiration, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty obscure. Um, so that, that, there might be others. Those, those are kind of the ones that come to mind. Ah, um, so apparently somebody has implemented internationalization it, for all languages. Do they have an internationalization framework or just a Spanish? 
So we have inter internationalization of, uh, of, of Python error messages this is coming. So when I say future, I, I, I always have to quote uh, uh, William Gibson, who famously said, you know, the future is already here, it just isn't evenly distributed yet. Um, and, and so that's why we could look at things like Mathematica or, or, or Haskell or, and say, oh, you know, the future that we're imagining is, is over there, but it's not over here yet, so we can, we can bring it over here. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad to see, I, so I always hate making these things because I always say, oh, we can't do such and so, and why can't we, let's do that in the future, and somebody always says, oh, no, we, we've been doing that for years. Uh, so, so, yeah, so we're further ahead in Python than I thought. Advisors said, "Well, you can't. 
I said, why not? I said, well, because it's too complicated. It's too difficult. Nobody can figure out. It's, it's, you, know, you need years and years of training. You can't teach this thing to everybody. So he brought in Al Quinn of York from, from Scotland, who in those days, for some reason, Scotland was the center of literacy in Europe. Um, to come to his court and make it easier to read and write. And Alcuin did two things, first off. First thing he did was he invented a script that had constant ascender and descender heights for letters. Prior to that time, it was arbitrary and there was no such idea of font, so each monastery when they copied used their own way of making the letters. And so if you were from a different monastery, you had difficulty figuring out what that monastery wrote. <clears throat> But by standardizing the fonts, it's called the Merovingian minuscule, Carolingian minuscule, and, and uh, it's pretty much the basis of all fonts that we have today. And then the second thing that he did was he invented spaces between words. Look, look at classical buildings, right? There's all these letters carved on them, and they don't put spaces between words. Now, again, you look back and you say, I could have thought of that. <laughs> In fact, that's the definition of genius in, in, in my family. That when an idea, when somebody tells you an idea and you go, <clears throat> I could have thought of that, that's genius. <laughs> because you didn't think of that, right? But it's, but it, you know, it, it, it's so simple that it must be genius. So he thought of space between words. So the combination of the two meant that if you looked at a piece of paper that had a word on it, you could see the whole shape of the word, which meant you could actually read word at a time. Because until that, those two things were invented, you had to look at each glyph, try to figure out what letter that was, and try to decide if that was the end of the word or the start of the next word. And so it was, it was not, that's why they illuminated manuscripts. Put little pictures to give you a hint as to what was going on, because it was so hard to read. It, reading silently probably didn't come in until like 1200. You had to sort of sound it out, try to figure out what was going on. So, anyway, so spaces between words falls in again. So, yes, and then punctuation came later, right? Then they, they, they invented commas and periods and capital letters to, to tell you that it was the beginning of a, you know. Anyway, so we, we made uh, italics. We made all of these inventions to make it easier to read so that by the time we get to 1300, even before the printing, by that point, 500 years later, it is actually easy enough that you could teach 25% of the children of Florence how to read. But if you had tried that, so the reason Charlemagne failed, even if he was the emperor, is because it really was too hard to teach everybody how to do it. So my argument is, the reason you can't teach everybody how to program is because it's too hard. Right? And there are things like spaces between words, which if I were smart enough, I would think of them, and everybody would go, Pfft. But I can't think of these things. So I throw out suggestions for things which might be that thing. And I, and I know that I'm not succeeding because usually people say, no, that would never work. <laughs> um, okay, but so.